Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. Well, good morning once again. If you're uh, tuning in a little bit late to the live stream, welcome. Uh, once again, reminding you that I'll be doing a Facebook Live tomorrow night, taking your questions, a little Ask Pastor Matt thing at about 7 o'clock Eastern Time. If you have any questions, send them to me via Facebook, via Twitter, pa at uh, Pastor Matt R, Twitter, Matt Rawlings on Facebook, or just to my email, Pastor Matt R at yahoo.com. Now, uh, jumping into this, we're in Luke 10. So open your Bible, your Bible app, whatever, to Luke 10, 25. And that's where we're going to go. Now, here's the deal. Uh, those of you who have um, had to endure my preaching and teaching uh, for several years here, you know that um, I am a raging geek. And one of the things that I love to do is to research human behavior. And, and why do people hold this opinion? Why do people do this? And one of the things that I was researching while I was uh, preparing this sermon was this. Where does prejudice come from? Why is it that some people are very prejudiced and some people are not? Where does that come from? Well, I was reading this week in a couple of psychology journals that found that, found that some studies say that some people who are prejudiced, who are biased, who, who look down on, on people for their race or their gender or, or, or whatever, that these people tend to not like ambiguity. They don't like anything that's, that's unclear. They like to take people not as complex, you know, individuals who have been formed by life experience and so forth, but just, oh, they look this way, therefore they're this. Or they're this gender, therefore they're this. They don't like to think through it. And so, because of that, the only thing that psychologists argue that will work to help break, just burst, crush that prejudice is for that person who holds those biases to meet and befriend somebody that they've categorized, stereotyped, and come to know that that's just not true. And that's about the only way it uh, can be done. And if I've got time today, I'll, I'll come back to that. But why do I bring that up? It has to do with the section of Luke that we're dealing with today. As you've known, as we've gone through Luke, I've tried to point out how large chunks of Luke, they flow together. There's, there's a similar theme there that you need to pick up on in order to really understand it. And I think we're going to see that in 1025 through 42. We're going to look first at the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, I'm going to argue that we have somewhat misunderstood the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan is often preached as teaching compassion. Well, I don't think that compassion is out of line there. I think that is in the parable, but I don't think that's the primary point that Jesus was trying to make. So let's take a look at it. 1025, reading from the NIV. On one occasion, an expert in the law, some of your translations will say a lawyer, that's a bad translation. These were known as scribes. So what a scribe did in ancient Israel is these were people that were fairly well educated, uh, they knew the Jewish law, and so because, but they weren't rabbis. So what they would do is the rabbis and Jewish leadership would take these folks who knew the law well, were fairly well educated, but didn't want to be a rabbi, and they would take them and put them into like bureaucratic, uh, administrative type jobs. So they would be magistrates or, or whatever, and they, they would help carry the priest's load. That's, that's what they would do. And so this is one of those guys. And he stood up to test Jesus. Now notice that, to test Jesus. So his question is not sincere. He's trying to trap Jesus. He's trying to push Jesus up against the wall, because remember, all the religious leaders, with very few exceptions, are very jealous of Jesus, and they're trying to find a way to stop him. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Interesting question coming from a scribe, because quite frankly, most scribes believed that they were already saved. They'd already be in the afterlife with God. They'd spend an eternity with God just by virtue 
of having been the offspring of Abraham. If you were a pure Israelite, born one, circumcised, kept the food laws, celebrated the holidays, didn't defile yourself and become unclean, you were in. That's how they saw it. It's a strange question, but of course it's a test. Verse 26, Jesus replied, what is written in the law? Or how do you read it? Actually saying, how do you interpret it? And so the scribe answered. He said, verse 27, love your, the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Strength there actually can be uh, translated from the Greek ability. With all your ability and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. I'm going to come back to that. I don't think neighbor is the, is the correct translation there. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, or he wanted to vindicate himself. He wanted to win an argument is what he wanted to do. And so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, the reason why I don't like that translation, the Greek word can be translated as neighbor. It can also be translated as one near to you. But it can also be translated, according to a number of Greek scholars, as a fellow human being. In other words, somebody on par with me. What, the, what this scribe is asking Jesus is, who do I treat as equals and who do I look down on? That's what he's really asking. That's really what he's asking. Now, and I'm not trying to be anti-Semitic here or, or to spike some kind of anti-Semitic fervor. I'm just pointing out historically, in the first century in Israel, many of the Jewish people looked upon Gentiles and Samaritans, which we'll get to in a minute, as below them. They didn't worship the, the God, uh, the, the one true God. They didn't worship correctly. They didn't keep food laws. They didn't keep Sabbath. That's therefore, in some Jewish writings, like the Talmud, Jewish rabbis actually refer to Gentiles as less than human. Now, here's where I'm going to cut them some slack here, despite their prejudice. The reason, one of the reasons why so many Israelites held this prejudice, this bias, this really racism, is because they saw themselves as victims. They had seen the, the Greeks and the Romans and the Assyrians and the Babylonians, so forth, conquer them, persecute them. All throughout the Roman Empire, Jews were made fun of by Romans because they were called lazy, because they insisted on taking the Sabbath off. Most Romans worked seven days a week. And so they saw themselves as victims. I read a book many years ago uh, written by a guy named Cornelius Plantiga at, at Calvin College. And the book was called Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. And in that book he says, it's a book about sin, and he says one of the worst things anybody can ever do is see themselves as a victim. Because once you see yourself as a victim, you can justify all kinds of horrific acts to get justice. And that's what's going on here. And it's not just ancient Israel. A lot of this happens to so many people, so many people around the world. Verse 30. So in reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Uh, this road from Jerusalem to Jericho was notorious. The road's about 17 miles long. It twists and winds. There are many caves along that road where robbers were known to pounce on people. Verse 31, a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. Why did the priest, this Israelite priest, coming down probably from serving his uh, tenure at the temple, probably headed home to Jericho because that's where a number of priests lived. Why does he go, not just not help the person, but literally go to the other side? Some people said, well, he did not want to defile himself. He did not want to become unpure. But some rabbis in the first century actually said that if you helped a fellow Israelite, 
that that would not make you unpure. So I'm not sure that that's what's going on here. Maybe the priest was afraid the robbers would come after him. That's a possibility. But Jesus gives no motivation. The priest just passes him by and goes on his way. Verse 32, so too a Levite, a Levite was kind of an assistant priest, a junior priest who worked at the temple. When he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side as well. See that? Again, no motivation given. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Now, who are the Samaritans? Samaritans are Jewish. Their background, their, their genealogy is Jewish. It went down this way. In ancient Israel, you had a number of foreign armies come in and conquer Israel. You had the Egyptians try to conquer Israel. You had the Assyrians. You had the Babylonians. And when the Assyrians came, they actually wiped out most of Israel. Uh, Judah was left, but most of the rest of Israel, they took away the wealthy people and the highly trained people, the educated people, and they took them back to Assyria as slaves, and they left the rest of them there, and they left a, a huge portion of the Assyrian army there, and they began to intermarry with them. And so Jews looked down on Samaritans as, forgive me, half-breeds. Moreover, then, because they weren't welcomed in the Jewish temple, they built their own temple on a mountain, and Jews often attacked that temple and tried to destroy it, tried to disrupt what they saw as false worship in Israel. The Samaritans, in turn, tried to desecrate the Jerusalem temple by scattering uh, bones and so forth there. They were enemies. The average Jewish person hated the average Samaritan and vice versa. But the Samaritan sees, and sees him and takes pity. Verse 34, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. The oil uh, would help soothe the wounds. The wine would help disinfect it. Then he put the man on his own donkey, which means the man's probably walking. Put the, put the man who was injured on his donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. That's money. He said, look after him. And when I return... I will reimburse you for any extra expense. Now, Jesus asks in verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor or, I think, a fellow human being? The man who, to the man who fell into the robbers, which one was more humane? Which one was acting more like the image and likeness of God? Which one? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Hmm. So I think that you can see that this parable is not so much about compassion. That's in there to be sure. But it's primarily about prejudice. It's about prejudice. And that's what he's dealing with. And that's what this entire section of Luke is dealing with. Racial prejudice, ethnic prejudice. And now, when we move on, it's dealing with sexism looking down on another gender. Let's go. One, two. Verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now this. I know you've probably, if you're a Christian, you've probably read this many times, but did you know this is scandalous? Only disciples were allowed to see, sit at the foot of a rabbi, and only men could be disciples. See what's going on here? But Jesus is allowing it. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made, and she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. Many of you read that automatically think of Brady Bunch. You're old enough. Marsha, Marsha, Martha. The Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Jesus is saying, let her sit, let her learn. That's more important. Don't be too hard on Martha here. I mean, she's getting ready to 
uh, feed at least 15, probably more people. You have the 12 disciples, you've got Jesus, you've got the two sisters. Uh, Lazarus may have been around somewhere. And so you've got a whole house full of people. And she's jumping from pot to pot, and she's up to her elbows and suds and all that other kind of stuff. And so you don't want to be too hard on Martha. You can understand where she's coming from, but see, I've heard this preached many times, this section, and sometimes what people will say, including one of my favorite preachers of all time, Fred Craddock, he believes that this section is about spiritual discernment. Because in the first section, Jesus says, go and do. And then in the next section, he goes, sit and listen. And which one is it? Go and do or sit and listen? And Fred Craddock said, Jesus said, uh-huh. Depends. Okay. That is one way to see this, but I'm not convinced that that's really what's going on here. And Jesus is not, you know, he doesn't, when he says Martha, Martha, the Greek there is showing emotion. He's, he sympathizes with, with Martha. He sees that she's working hard and hospitality, welcoming people in, feeding them. That was considered a sign of a good Israelite. She's doing a good thing. But he's saying there, yes, that's a good thing. Thank you for welcoming us. Thank you for working so hard. But when the Son of God speaks, it's time to stop and sit and listen. And everyone, everyone, race, gender, regardless, needs to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn. Jesus here, I've seen this, this section abused but Jesus is not upending the biblical teaching from the Old Testament, from Paul, elsewhere, that men should be the head of the household and the head of the church. That's not what Jesus is saying. You can be a disciple of Jesus Christ and not be a leader. We're all called to be disciples of Jesus Christ, regardless. I am uh, very proud of my wife. If you don't attend here and you're watching the, the live stream, she was the one uh, helping to lead worship, and she was, you know, absolutely appalled at what she called her lack of rhythm. She was watching and trying to clap. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and the, the, the three there, Andrew uh, Rawlings, our youth minister, was in the center, and then that uh, handsome young African man, uh, Eddie, who just had a birthday this week, by the way. But my wife, you know, has her own ministry, The Bold Movement, which focuses on teaching women how to study the Bible, how to disciple other women, how to study things like apologetics and so forth. And, and I'm proud of her. And I remember the time that she came up with the tagline for her ministry. The tagline for her ministry is, fluff is for pillows, not for women's ministry. And I think she's right. She told me, she said she's just, she got absolutely sick of seeing so many women's ministries that were basically children's ministries. The level of, of study in Scripture, the level of historical and cultural background, surface level, the stuff you teach kids. But Jesus says, men, women, come sit at my feet and learn, all of you. All of you. Have we learned that lesson? Too many churches. Too many churches. Treat women like second-class citizens. And they don't feed them, to use a scriptural phrase, meat. And that's a shame. That's a shame. This section is saying, you don't look down on anyone, anyone, regardless of who they are, what they've done. You don't look down on anyone. You don't treat them any differently. When it comes especially to growing closer to God and learning the Word of God, all men, all women, all races all come together to sit at the feet of Jesus Christ. All of them. Do you remember a few weeks ago when we were in Luke 9, and I was talking about the transfiguration? After the transfiguration, Jesus comes down the mountain, and he finds that several of his disciples were unable to expel a demon from a young boy. 
The father of the young boy does not say, Jesus, Jesus, please heal my child. Expel the demon. He says, Jesus, look at my child. Just look. Because he knew that if Jesus just looked upon him, he would have compassion. Do you look at people as people? As the beloved of God? Or do you look at them just as people in your way, driving slow in the left lane? Guilty. People who take their grocery cart and stick it right in the middle of a grocery aisle and just sit there and look around like they're looking at the Sistine Chapel. And you're like, ah, oh, come on, move. I do that. I'm guilty of that. That moment, I just see that person as, in, as something in my way, not someone that God made loves. I want to share a quick story. I didn't do this last night, uh, but I want to do it today. I, as many of you know, uh, after I went to seminary, I went to law school. And one of the things that when I was in law school I had to do uh, in my uh, end of my second year was take what's called a clinic. This is when you actually leave uh, the classroom where you're just sitting there reading case after case after case and you're going back and forth with your professor on, on just you know, tearing this case apart and the logic behind it and all kind of stuff. This is when you get out of the building and you go do actual legal work. What a concept. And so the clinics that were available to me at my law school, one was uh, helping uh, the poor get uh, whatever benefits they, they needed. It was basically kind of working with uh, some local advocates for the poor there. But at the time, I was going to be a prosecutor. I wanted to be a criminal attorney. And so they had their other clinic was a death penalty clinic, what they call now the capital trial clinic, where you help two professors. You basically serve as a private investigator for the two professors, and you help defend somebody that's facing the death penalty. So I looked at those two, and I said, give me death penalty. And they were going through all the cases. We were all sitting there listening to the two professors, and one of them said, well, we've got this case. We're defending this young man. This young man and another man, they escaped from a jail, small jail in Kentucky. They made their way into Indiana. They, they boosted a car. They picked up a couple girls that one of them knew. They drove through some place called, get this, this is how they pronounced it, Portsmouth. You can tell they've never been there. They went to some place called Huntington, and then they went down into South Carolina. During that time, they kidnapped two girls. They have not been found. Well, I worked the case. I said, give me that case. That's my, that's part of that is my home territory. Um, I grew up in Portsmouth. I know Huntington. I know it happened at the Huntington Mall. Been there many, many, many times. I'll take that case. He said, you got it. I flew down to Columbia, South Carolina the next week, and for eight hours I sat in a jail cell with a man accused of double homicide and talked to him. He didn't try to get anything past me. He was pretty brutally honest about it. Well, I did the investigation. I actually worked beyond that clinic, spent a lot of time working that case. But he was found, we actually pleaded guilty and went right to the penalty phase. We were arguing that there was no evidence that shows that our client was the one who committed the homicides, in all likelihood it was the other guy, and that our client should just serve life in prison. Well, it didn't happen. The jury gave him the death penalty, and he sits on death row now in Indiana. He sent me a letter just last month. He calls me every once in a while, every, I don't know, six months or something, he'll call me. And I talk to him. And I pray with him. Now, why do I do that? Is it because I'm just so righteous and progressive? And no. No. You guys know me. I, I confess. I struggle with selfishness and, and comfort more than anything else. But I remember a sermon that I heard when I was in seminary that one of my professors taught. He was talking about the book of, of Jonah. Now, if you've never read the book of Jonah, you should, but you need to read it with adult eyes. 
Everybody who reads the book of Jonah thinks it's all about the great fish or the whale. It's not. Uh, that whale's not do or big fish, whatever it is, it's not doing much. It shows up for basically one scene. Uh, it is salvation to Jonah, not punishment, and it is cheap transportation for Jonah to get to Nineveh. I mean, that's, that's it. The fish has almost nothing to do with that story. The story goes like this. God tells Jonah, who's one of his prophets, if you know what a prophet is, it's not somebody who uh, reads the future. A prophet is somebody who is commissioned by God to speak to God's people for God. That's what a prophet is. And he tells Jonah, he says, you're going to go and preach a sermon of repentance. And Jonah says, great, but you're going to go preach it in Nineveh. And Jonah said, no, I don't like them. Are you kidding me? They're our enemies. They're barbaric people. They just go out of their country and they raid villages and they kill and they plunder. I'm not going to go preach repentance to them. And God said, oh, yeah, I'll take care of that. You don't say no to God. And so God gets Jonah to Nineveh, and he preaches, and lo and behold, the Ninevites repent. And they turn to the one true God, at least for a while. And Jonah gets mad. He goes up, and he's sitting under a, a bush, and, he, and he's sitting there uh, in the shade, and he's just pouting. And God says, what's wrong, Jonah? And Jonah says, I knew you would do this. I knew it. I knew that if I preached, they repented, you'd have mercy on them, and they don't deserve mercy. And God said, Jonah, look around. Look at them. Look at them. I made them. I knitted them together in their mother's womb. I've watched them. They're mine. What would you have me do? See, the whole point of Jonah, again, nothing to do with the fish or the whale. The point of Jonah is God loves the Ninevites too. Do you? I guess we all have our struggles, our bias. But God loves the Ninevites. How do we deal with prejudice? How do we deal with our own struggle, our own sinful struggle, to look at others as below us, beneath us? How do we struggle with that? How do we get beyond that seeing people as people, as the creation of God, beloved by God, not just as a race or a gender or this or that? I, um, on Sunday mornings, uh, while we're getting ready, Megan and I always turn on a, a TV show that used to be, when Charles Osgood hosted it, was supposed to be a weekly show about good news instead of all the bad news. Now it's kind of a mix, but I remember seeing a show on it. It, it seems like it was several years ago, and I'm not sure that I, I, I remember the details correctly, so forgive me if I get this wrong, but this is how I remember it. A young African-American orphan was going in for treatment, and I can't remember if it was for cancer or for kidney dialysis. And there was an older, widowed woman, white woman, who would go at the same time, and they would sit together. She'd never had a black friend, and he'd never had a white one. He'd never had a friend that was a girl either, or a woman. So at first, they would sit there, talk about their illness, talk about their treatments, talk about those struggles. But then they began to talk about more than that, where they came from, what they do. They became friends, such good friends closer than some families. They have holidays with each other. They check on each other every day. They listen to each other. They care for each other. Different genders, different races, different generations. Friends. Love each other as friends. And it all started 
because they recognize they have the same illness. We all have the same illness. It's called sin. It's called sin. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that we have the technology you have provided so that we could stream these services. I pray for all those out there listening who are struggling with their mental and emotional health. I pray that you'll bring them peace. I pray that those who are out there who don't know you, who don't have a saving relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ, that they would know the gospel. They would know that you sent your son to earth to live a perfect life, to go to the cross to pay the penalty for all the sins of all those who would call him Lord and you the one true God, that they would know this, place their faith in this, and that they would have the strength to reach out to me or to fellow Christians and begin their journey. And for those of us who are already on this journey, help us through your Holy Spirit not to hold any prejudice, not to hold any amount of sexism within us, to see every person, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, may we every person around us as your beloved creation. Help us with that. We pray for mercy. We pray for especially for our first responders and our healthcare workers right now. Pray for New York City and Italy and Louisiana and all the hot spots. Help us, dear Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, I'm done. So, again, I'll be on Facebook Live tomorrow night. If you have questions about the faith, please send them to me. Send them to my email, pastormattr at yahoo.com, or send them via Facebook or Twitter. Uh, Pastor Matt R. on Twitter, Matthew Rawlings on Facebook. You can send them to me. Um, you can send them to Megan, my wife. Um, and so we'll try to answer his questions as best I can tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Uh, if you're a, a woman here at Christ Community Church, be sure to join my wife's Zoom call, a devotional and prayer on Tuesday night at 6.30. You can be looking on her Facebook and the CCC closed group on Facebook, which, by the way, I spent yesterday morning trying to go through, you know, the people you may know and so forth, and, or my friends who aren't part of the CCC, CCC closed group. I've been trying to send as many friend requests as I can for people who I know uh, are familiar with our ministries here or who attend church here either regularly or sporadically. I've been trying to add all those people as, as friends. So uh, if you get a friend request from me, that's what's going on. I'm trying to make sure that you're connected here and trying to get you into the CCC closed group and so forth. But, and then Wednesday night on Zoom, I'll be hosting a devotional and men's prayer. And stay tuned for what mom's going to be doing, what our children's ministry is going to be doing, what Andrew will be doing with the youth group. We may be doing some more stuff. I'm thinking about doing a Saturday morning Bible study via Facebook Live. So stay connected with all that. Keep reading Scripture. I know the days are long when you're holed up, but remember in the words of my friends Dino and Michelle, be decent to each other. Be patient with each other. When the weather's nice, get out. Walk around. Come down to the church building. Walk around the building. If you go all the way around the building, it's .34 miles, so you, so you know. Folks, take care. God's in control. We'll get through this. If we're smart, social distance, care for one another, wear a mask or gloves when you go outside. If you can, if you've got them, wash your hands regularly. Keep them away from your face, especially your mouth and your nose and so forth. And we'll be okay. We'll be okay. And we'll gather again together. And that's going to be a great, great weekend. God bless you. God goes with you. And remember, Easter next weekend, put together your underground church in your living room or wherever. Get your kids together. And we're going to worship with our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. See you next time. Christ Community meets on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our Facebook page.